It's Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for joining us. Well, it's tax season, and we're going to talk about a number of aspects about filing your taxes, especially tax debt stress. We all have that. But first, it's election time. April 23rd is the Pennsylvania primary, and there are lawsuits. As usual, elections can get contentious. We'll get to that and more following these words. Welcome to the fast-paced and unrehearsed weekly discussion featuring the leaders who help shape your world. Join us as we address the issues that impact you each and every day. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. All right, welcome back. Well, some important topics, and we got two uh, Capitol reporters uh, joining us to talk about them. Zach Hoops, he's with the Harrisburg Patriot News Pen Live, and Angela Columbus with Spotlight PA. All right, Angela, let me start with you. I'll tell you, it's almost every day there's another lawsuit <laughs> filed dealing with elections. It's gotten very contentious. G give us a few sentences about the important, uh, the important uh, lawsuits. Well, um, in, in short, buckle up. There's going to be a buckle lot up. of lawsuits being filed in relation to the election, in particular because we are almost certainly going to see a rematch between President Biden and former President Donald Trump. And Pennsylvania, as everybody knows, is a battleground state. Right. And last, uh, in the last uh, election four years ago, was the decider in uh, President Biden's victory. So, uh, as it stands right now, probably the most significant lawsuit is in uh, federal court, and it'll come to no surprise uh, to anybody who follows election-related issues that the issue in that lawsuit has to do with mail ballots, which uh, have been attacked by uh, President, former President Trump, in particular, as uh, leading potentially to widespread fraud. Right. Obviously, they're baseless allegations, but it has resonated. Is that resonated. because the signature isn't proper or the so outer this, envelope? It's the outer envelope, right? That's correct. This lawsuit in particular has to do with undated or incorrectly dated mail ballots. Sometimes people uh, put their birth date instead of the date that they're yeah. sending the ballot. And these ballots are now, um, some counties have uh, had problems. They don't know what to do with these types of ballots. There have been there's been lawsuits about this in the past, but this one is in federal mm. court, has the potential to go all the way up to the U.S. Supreme, Supreme court. court. Here's what's surprising to me about this. First of all, if you apply for uh, to vote by mail, that's known to county officials. When you submit the vote, that's known. So, what's the relevance in the date on the outer envelope and whether that's correct or not? Well, that's an excellent question, and that's part of what um, uh, litigants who brought the, the lawsuit are arguing. Um, it's the NAACP, the Pennsylvania chapter, and other voting rights groups. They're saying, look, uh, not counting these ballots, if they have been timely received by the counties, right. yeah. violates the Civil Rights Act, um, which is, and the materiality provision in there, which says, right. you know, insignificant errors should not stand in the way right. of a person's right to vote. Yeah, good. All right. All right. Um, let's continue with elections and uh, what's been referred to as a dearth, a lack of poll workers. Is that a, a big issue right now? It's, uh, it's difficult to gauge. Um, I was at an event uh, maybe a month ago, where the secretary of the Commonwealth, Al Schmidt, the guy who's in charge of voting in Pennsylvania, was trying to recruit poll workers. The state does a lot of events like that um, all around the state. Um, but what the counties, from what I've seen, are saying is that they are seeing a significant turnover in poll workers. Um, it's, it's hard to tell if there's a shortage, per se, right now, but um, there's people come, people go. They're constantly trying to get new people in. Um, and as Angel mentioned, there's a lot of intrigue surrounding elections that can make things difficult for poll workers in some cases. Um, yeah. but, uh, there, but there is concern out there from uh, officials who are responsible, county officials, for conducting elections, correct? Yeah, it's a constant battle to keep, to keep poll workers um, yeah. in the ranks. Um, and it's also it's an aging workforce. Um, you know, most of the folks. Who yeah, do they have that to be are, trained, right? Yeah, 
It's become Baldwin. a very high stress position and job yeah. to do because uh, there's so much scrutiny anymore in how elections are conducted. Well, look, we're, we're, let's run to a break. When we come back, I want to talk about post-election lawsuits, and then we want to get into cyber taxes and where all that goes, and we'll do that uh, after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania State Education Association, bringing the power of a great education to our schools, our students, and our communities. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. All right, reporter Zach Hoops and Angela Columbus are my guests for uh, at least one more segment. All right, Angela, I want to talk about it. It seems like the post-election lawsuits just do not end. It's like elections have not just become contentious in terms of how they're conducted, the way they're conducted, but after the election, there's more contention. Right. So uh, lawyers, election lawyers, legal scholars, um, election officials, they are bracing for an onslaught post-election. Uh, those lawsuits generally will target things like how counties um, uh, counted ballots and or the processes or any potential problems that came up on election day at the polls. Um, and that's all well and fine, except that there are very set deadlines in Pennsylvania for things like uh, certifying the results of the election. December 11th is a big date. People should remember that is the date that right. the governor has to send to Congress uh, the list of electors. Uh, for each presidential candidate. Right, we're in and a presidential winner. election year. We got to have electors. From That's PA. correct. Um, and you know, there there is so much confusion at this point in time. What would happen if the lawsuits drag out and that December 11th deadline is missed and Pennsylvania is unable to send its results to Congress? Uh, that is still being and worked. And we're out. one of the most competitive states in the country. Absolutely, we are a battleground state. Like I said earlier, we decide Pennsylvania decided the election in 2020, so it yeah. is um, going to be very closely watched. Yeah, you you agree? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and I, through um, budget hearings that I've been keeping track of recently, one of the big issues is that there are some ambiguities in Pennsylvania's election law, particularly in Act 77, um, that are kind of provide the avenues for some of these lawsuits that come after the voting results. And it's one of those things that is constantly being talked about by lawmakers, right. particularly during Department of State hearings, things like that. Right. But the chance of there actually being a bipartisan agreement to clean up some of these issues yeah. is probably very, very slim. Um, you're, Terry, the legislature could fix this. It can pass legislation containing items that counties have not just asked for, they've begged for for, for yeah. almost four years now. But will they? It doesn't appear uh, that that is going to be the case, as Zach said, because uh, there are um, there are Republicans in particular who want to also uh, include things like voter ID. Uh, in the equation, and that does not have broad support. Yeah. Some of the fixes yeah. to Act 77 do. Okay. All right, let's turn on to cyber attack. Yeah, there what was— What is it? Well, um, at the end of February, Change Healthcare, which is um, a national medical um, billing and claims system that is uh, owned by United Health, uh, was the— subject of a, a massive ransomware attack, um, and we've been seeing some national headlines about that. Unclear how big it's going to be. A lot of places are saying that it's, now, it's really going to have a huge impact. Now, what's that mean when you say a ransomware attack? Um, my understanding is that the hacking group stole um, information, locked files, and demanded uh, money to um, 
So to get they get the, the information personal back. information about people, and then they get money from them. Is that what you're uh, from the from change from the corporate entity? They're trying oh, to get okay. money from. Now I've also seen reports that um, that a ransom may have been paid, but that's not entirely clear at this time. Um, the issue for Pennsylvania or for state government um, is that a number of the healthcare providers that provide services to Medicaid patients. Um, are also impacted, and this makes it very difficult for them to send claims to the State right. Department of Human Services um, or to the managed care organizations that do Medicaid yeah. managed care. Um, this came out during a budget hearing this week that right. the, the DHS said they were very concerned about how Big long deal. it would go. Uh, yes, because the concern is that uh, patients will not be able to receive services if uh, providers can't bill uh, for money to to cover those services so the potential for real harm is there some yeah. of these places where it may just simply flat out run out of money if they can't bill yeah, for the medicaid point. services they're providing uh, many places particularly nursing homes just don't have that much right. cash on hand right. all right well i want to thank you for coming on okay we're going to turn to uh, can you ease your tax debt stress it's tax season and we all get a little stress and we'll talk about that and more after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Cross State Credit Union Association. Credit unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, go to ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties, representing the faculty and coaches who are devoted to providing quality public higher education for Pennsylvania's college students. Welcome back. Well, as I said earlier, it's tax season and we're going to talk about some important tax subjects with a couple of experts. One is how to ease your tax debt stress, and we all get that. And joining me to do that is Pamela Mon. She's the CEO with the York Educational uh, FCU, and Brad Simpson, he's the CFO with the Cross State Credit Union Association. Folks, welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Pam, I'm going to start with you. I love this. How to ease your stress. Boy, we do get some stress when we're talking about filing our income tax, don't we? We certainly do. Um, but some of the things that you can do to help lessen that stress is make sure you're filing your taxes on time. Right. That's important. Um, if you file them late, what will happen is the IRS will subject you to some penalties and fines, and that just adds to your stress. So just make sure you file them on time. Yeah. I was going to say that that's pr pr pretty important. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to make an agreement with the IRS if you have trouble paying. Is that correct? Uh, that is uh, absolutely. You know, you have to uh, you have to pay your taxes no matter what. <laughs> yeah. um, so you know, again, to what Pam said, you have to file on time. The key is to file on time. Uh, the most important thing is that, and then working with the IRS. The IRS has multiple options if you do owe, mm -hmm. um, but you do have to file on time because the, the the other side is a lot worse for you. I should say, can you work out a deal, or I guess the word, the better word is a compromise with the IRS? You can. They, you give them a call. Um, you talk to them. They're willing to talk to you. The IRS will, you know, accommodate you to certain degrees. But if you do owe in, you can go to a payment plan, depending on what you owe. Um, so they will work with you on that. Um, also, um, you know, like Brad said, you want to make sure you just do it on time. We can't stress that enough yeah. because the penalties yeah. and the interest add on, and you, you, do, you don't want to add on if you have to owe in. Yeah. So, but they do have payment plans. They will work with you um, to accommodate what you're willing to or can afford to pay um, the amount that you owe back. All right, Brad, let's go to another important subject. Can you protect yourself and your tax refund? Uh, absolutely. You know, everything uh, in today's world, you know, is about protecting yourself, about protecting your information. 
Um, the IRS is not going to uh, send you an email. They're not going to contact you via social media. <laughs> um, you know, they're still very much uh, restricted in the ways that they will contact you. Um, and it's just very important to keep your information, you know, secure and private. Um, much like anything, not just taxes, but in general, obviously. Sure. Yeah, making sure that you're, you know, guarding your personal information. I was going by, to say, that's an important mm -hmm. element here. That's very big. I mean, change your passwords every so often. I know in our industry, some days, it's, it seems like every day we're changing our password, but 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Change your passwords on your computer, um, you know, you can call the credit bureau and protect your credit report as well. There's just a lot of different things that you can do, but in, most importantly, it is changing your passwords regularly to yeah. help you out. Here's one that uh, you've mentioned before, uh, income tax impersonators. I mean, imagine that. I'm from, I, oh, I'm from the uh, Fe Federal Bureau of Taxation and you owe money, send it to me, right? Right. Yeah, we all get those phone calls so that, you know, if you don't pay, uh, pay mm -hmm. by a certain time, the police are going to come and to your house and arrest you. And yeah. they're the best advice. If it, if, it just, if it doesn't sound right, it isn't right. Yeah. And, you know, hang up the phone or don't answer mm -hmm. the phone in that regard. Um, the IRS has an identity protection uh, specialized unit. Mm -hmm. um, so if it doesn't if it doesn't feel right. I mean, are they likely to call you on the phone? No. Are they likely to send no. you a letter if no. you have a problem? Like Brad said, they're very old school. They're going to communicate through you, to you through paper, not social media, not the phone. And even if you have to call the IRS, when you call them, they identify who they are and they give you a badge number. So you can actually go back and make sure, oh, is this person with this badge number, yeah. actually an IRS employee, and there's ways to confirm that. All right, we're going to run to a break. When we be back, I want to talk about ways that you can deal with uh, a problem that you have, like funding a college education or invest in your home or ways that you can use. Is this, we're talking about your refund, which we hope you get as opposed to having to pay, I think, I'm not sure, back after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania American Water. We keep life flowing across the Keystone State. All right, it's tax season. We're talking about a number of aspects of uh, tax filing and what to do with your refund. In fact, that's the next question. Best ways to spend your tax return? Take it, Brad. Uh, savings and, and debt relief are always going to be your best options. You know, if you do get that return, uh, you know, paying down debts that you do have, adding That's an additional point. payment uh, to credit cards, student loans, that sort of debt. That's going to go the furthest. Uh, and then just any type of savings. And there's many, many different ways yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that you can add to savings uh, for you. But you can also you know, invest in your home, fund college education. I mean, it, it seems to me that there's so many relevant ways, important relevant ways to spend these, uh, whatever the return is that you get. Yeah, you don't want to overspend or splurge on something. You really want to take that money and use it to benefit your current situation. So yes, put it in your savings, contribute to a college fund, maybe make a donation to an organization that you're passionate about is a good way. Yeah. Um, invest in your family, invest in your home. Those are all great things. And depending on how much you get back on your tax return, maybe take three of those things and contribute to that. Yeah. Maybe not just the whole thing in one bucket, but maybe separate it out into three buckets to help your situation. And there are things we sh you should avoid with a tax refund, correct? Oh, absolutely. You know, any, anything that's going to uh, add further stress down the road uh, mm -hmm. should be avoided. I mean, the average return, I think, through February was $3,200, mm -hmm. and the the, the splurge purchase, you know, that I'm going to go get a new car because now I have $3,000 in my account. 
now you're gonna have a higher car payment, you're gonna have that for extended amount of time. You know, those are the things that you want to avoid. And and for, and they're victims, as we talked about before, but I want to get into greater detail. It's called identity theft. How common is that? Every day. Every day somebody's identity is being taken away from them. And once it's taken, it's hard to get back. So again, stressing the changing of passwords, um, you know, calling the credit bureau and putting what they call a red code on it so that people can't get your credit report. Um, you know, even putting things in your trash can. Like, yeah. get your mail, you know, get a shred or shred your stuff because mm -hmm. you get notices from credit card companies. People will go by your mailbox, open it up, and take things out. Even your bills. Pay your bills online as much as you can because people, you know, they're, they're not yeah. below that. And here's something I never heard of before, and that is that some you, you file uh, uh, your tax return and somebody else has already filed one using your information. Now, that's strange, but it, 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 is that a, a, a frequent problem? Uh, I don't know how frequent it is, but it certainly happens. I yeah. mean, the, the imposters mm -hmm. uh, are very good at what they do. And if they have information, personal information, that they then can uh, pretend to be you and file tax returns, yeah. um, they're off and, and running and before you know it. Right. Right. Okay. You're paid wages from an employer where you didn't work. That's another aspect. I mean, there's so many angles to this. There are a lot of angles. So, yes, if you file your tax return and the IRS is looking at it, once they file their return and they say they see a, a new employer on there, that might be a red flag for them. Um, again, your name showing up on two tax returns. Maybe your dependents are showing up on two Good tax point. returns. So they're going to reach out to you and, and let you know something's going on. And then once you get that notice, it's important to follow through and contact them so that they can start their investigation to help protect your identity through your yeah. tax return. How common are these things? They're not that common. I mean, while we're talking about mm -hmm. that, it, you know, these are not happening a lot, but they are happening. And that's the key, you know, is that they do happen. They will happen. Yeah. Um, and if they do happen to you, to make sure that you immediately, as Pam was saying, go through the process. And, you know, as we spoke earlier, you know, the IRS is going to formal, formally send you a notice. Um, act on that immediately. Yeah. Know? And is there somebody that you should use as a specialist when you get a, a problem like we're talking about? There are resources out there that you can um, definitely, you know, IRS website's one of them you can go to. Um, Contact your tax preparer, who that person is. Maybe they have um, some resources that they can share with you as well. So yeah, there's, there's sources out there for you to go to. Yeah, and it's, uh, as you say, not totally uncommon uh, problem. It, it's not. It does happen, you know. And it... Okay, thank you. Well, Great update. All right, we'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, stay well.